Let me, uh, let me start with this. How many of you have purchased a grill in the last few years? Anybody? They don't last like they used to, right? It's like they put some, some salt in the bottom of that thing before they sell it to you. Um, but, but if, so we, we got one, I don't know, two or three years ago, and uh, we just drove to Home Depot. We, we bought one of them. Somebody came out, they helped me load it into the back of the truck, got home, unloaded it, just wheeled it around to the back, connected the propane, and like five minutes later, you're grilling, right? Familiar with that process? How many of you bought a grill 20 or 25 years ago? So in, in 1999, Sarah and I bought our first house, and so I bought my first grill. And I went, and you know, they got them on display, one of each kind. And when you say, I'd like this one, they bring you a box. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this, I have put together a lot of things in my life. Nothing has come close to this grill that we bought when we were first married. So I, like everything else, I, I opened it, instructions, you know, who needs those, and just started to work on it. It was, it was one of the first times I was like, there is no way this thing is going together unless I use the instructions. And pretty much since, I just grabbed the instructions, just easier that way. Uh, but this thing, there were no two pieces that came together. Uh, everything had to be put together correctly. We're talking about a gas grill. You don't want leftover pieces. You don't want like half a burner laying in the box when you go to fire it up. Uh, so it had to be done right in order for it to work properly. And so as we look in these first chapters of Genesis, we see that, that uh, we're seeing that the world was created with a design in mind. There, there are certain things that were meant to work in certain ways in order for things to be good. And God said on the sixth day, this is very good. And so we're looking at one more of those things uh, this morning as we start to look at the, at the, family, at the family unit. And uh, we're going to look at the creation of male and female and the order that God's put into place. It's going to take a couple weeks for us to do this, but we're going to start this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start this morning in verse 24, uh, which is uh, day 6, and uh, we'll read through to the end of the chapter. So uh, Craig said we've been having a little bit of trouble with the computer back there. If it conks out, you'll just have to listen, but if not, you can... Uh, have your Bible open or read on the screen behind me. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 24 says, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Heavenly Fathers, we look at this passage this morning. I just ask that you would uh, give us understanding, help us to uh, see what you're teaching us through it, help us to understand how you created this world and ordered things to be. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would uh, submit to your design and to your creation and to your order and to, uh, to your rule over this earth and over our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start this morning by just talking a little bit about something called worldview. And uh, every one of us has a worldview, and it's 
kind of straightforward. It's how we view the world. Um, everybody does it a little bit differently. Now, uh, hopefully in this, in this room this morning, for those of us in this room who profess Christ as our Savior, we, all, we see it similarly. We should have a Christian or a biblical worldview. But there are, there are many worldviews out there, and they, your worldview answers the big questions in life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Does my life have purpose? Does my life have meaning? What is uh, the future to come? Like, where will I go when I die? What is the meaning and purpose of life? So it answers, your worldview answers those, those kinds of questions. And uh, Sean McDowell is a professor at Biola University in California, uh, and he just, he calls worldview your belief about reality. What do you believe about the world? And he says you can, you can do it by answer three questions. Where did we come from? What's wrong with the world? And how do we fix it? So he, he says he, you can put it into this kind of framework. So uh, the biblical worldview would be um, where did we come from? Creation, God created the world. Uh, he, he created, we were created by God to rule the world and to be in a relationship with him. Uh, God created the world. So uh, where do we come from? God created us. Uh, what's, what, is, uh, what is wrong with the world? Sin, right? So creation is where do we come from? The fall is what's wrong with the world. Sin entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned and every one of us have been sinning since. And so this creates a problem because it severs the relationship that we could have with God. Uh, So question number three, how do we fix it? Redemption. God has redeemed the world by sending his son into the world so that we could put our faith and trust in him and restore the relationship with the heavenly father. And one day, God will restore the entire world back into a perfect state. So you could sum it up, biblical worldview, creation, fall, redemption. What is, uh, excuse me, where did we come from? What's wrong with the world? How do we fix it? So um, last week, last week, um, before I go to last week, why does that matter? Why why talk about worldview? Well, because uh, not everybody has that worldview. And uh, and, and sometimes, Within our culture today, as, as, uh, as the church, people will look at the church and say, you guys, you're so old fashioned, you won't change your mind, you won't sway, you're just, you're out of date, you're irrelevant. Well, why, why would they say that? Because we're, we're holding on to our biblical worldview. While the culture's worldview, it sways, it changes. You can, it could be one thing today and you could make it something tomorrow. So we have fundamentally different views of the world. So I, I quoted last week uh, uh, Harvard biologist Richard uh, Lewinton. And I should have clarified it when I, when I read it, so I'm going to clarify it this morning. Uh, he starts out by saying this, we take the side of science, as this is him and maybe his staff, people that think like him, in spite of the absurdity of some of his constructs. I should have stopped right there, and I should have said he's not actually talking about science in, in this quote. He's talking about evolution. He says, he's, saying, he's really saying we take the side of evolution uh, despite the fact that it's a, some of it is absurd, some, it doesn't fulfill its promises, um, in spite of the fact that some of its claims are ups, unsubstantiated, uh, because, he says, we have a prior commitment to materialism, or some, some people might say naturalism, materialism just being this idea that if, if you can see it, feel it, and touch it, then it's real, and if you can't, then it's not real. Um, So his conclusion was the reason that they must adhere to these ideas of of materialism, even if it's counterintuitive, uh, even if it uh, doesn't make sense, he says materialism is absolute because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now he's speaking, he's really, he's not talking about science, he's speaking about evolution. And I want to say that because science and the Christian faith are not at odds with each other. I love science. Science reveals what God has created. 
God has created it, he's designed it, he's, he's ordered it to work a certain way. Science helps us to discover that and to understand that. So uh, this, this idea of materialism or naturalism, it's a different kind of worldview than a biblical worldview. It would say, there's no God. Humans are just highly evolved animals and the universe is a closed physical system. There's a big difference. You want to understand why you're at odds with somebody like that? You're not even looking at the world in the same way. This might be a good plug for Cal's uh, Wednesday night class that's coming up on July 6th, are you starting? Thinking about thinking. Uh, about About a three week study on Wednesday nights, 6.30. Uh, it's going to be up here in the, in, the, in the prayer meeting room, I think is where it's going to be. Going to be, going to be a great thinking about thinking. So, okay, the, the naturalist or the materialist, three questions. Where do we come from? What's wrong with the world? And how do we fix it? Well, we're here by random chance. Big bang, evolution, random mutations, we just happen to be here. That's where we came from. The problem with the world today is that humans are destroying the delicate balance of the Earth's ecosystem, and we can fix it through conservation and green energy. I don't know, I'm just making something up. But you you see what I'm saying? (laughs) Two different ways of looking at the world. And so obviously we have conflict. So the Christian worldview, we're created by God, to rule the world and to be in a relationship with him. The relationship was broken when Adam and Eve ate the, f- Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and we, look, we didn't need Adam and Eve to break that relationship. We're all good sinners on our own. And we, we, we've broken the relationship we have with God, and how do we fix that? Well, we can't fix it, but Jesus came into the world uh, to redeem all that was lost and all that was broken, and we can have a relationship through Jesus Christ. So be thinking about that. Be thinking about the biblical worldview. Be thinking about uh, maybe the worldview of people that you come into contact this week or have come into contact and they're just like, you're at odds with this person. Think to yourself, how do they view the world? Okay, we're gonna, we'll come back to that some next week, but just kind of laying a bit of a foundation. Um, and, and Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 is helping us to understand what the biblical worldview is. So, part of that we see here in, uh, in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, talking about the creation of uh, man and woman. Let me read verse 27 again. God created uh, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we, we have just, uh, you could say Genesis chapter 1 is really just sort of an overview. These are the things that happen in the six days. When you get to Genesis chapter 2, he's kind of going back and filling in some of the details of what happened um, on those days. Um, but we're just looking here, and, and we've said it before, very plainly, a biblical worldview is going to hold to this idea that God created man and woman. That's what, that's what the Bible teaches. So if we're not, if we don't think God is the one who created man and women, then we are not holding to um, a biblical worldview. And I think it's interesting, we talked, I think we mentioned it a couple weeks ago, and it says God created, it's the Hebrew, Hebrew word bara, B-A-R-A, so it says God created man in his own image. Only God can bara. Man cannot bara. God is the one that created man. God is the one that created uh, woman, male and female. So it's a, work of, it's a work of God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we get a little bit more detail um, as to how God did that. Genesis 2, 7 uh, says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Down in uh, verse 21 of chapter 2, details about the creation of woman. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed its place with flesh. And the rib that, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
So those are just some of the, some of the details of the, the creation. It wasn't, um, it was a little bit different than, than some of the other creation. God lets us know just exactly how he created man. And in a couple of things I want to just hit on here on uh, Genesis 1 verse 27, um, it says that we were created, that God created man in his own image. We were created uh, in the image of God. He, he says it twice. Created in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and fe- female, he created them. So men and women are created in the image of God. So we should ask ourselves, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, we know what an image is. Uh, If you have a phone with you this morning, you probably have pictures that you've taken of your kids or your grandkids or uh, some activity. Um, It is a image, it is a picture. It's not the real thing, but it is like the real thing. It represents the real thing. So if I have a picture of Sarah on my phone and I look at it, I know that I'm not looking at Sarah, but I keep it because it is like her and it, is, it represents her. And so uh, this, is, this is the idea. God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. God created man, and man is like God. God repre- uh, man represents God here on earth, but man is not God. I don't think that we would argue um, with that. So um, created them in his image, Um, What does that mean? Well, we're not like God physically. We're not all powerful. We're not all knowing. We're not everywhere all the time. But we are like God uh, in a spiritual sense. So some theologians would uh, break it down um, with some of these ideas that humans understand morality. We understand the difference between right and wrong. We're not just strictly driven by our desires uh, like an animal is. Um, We have a sense of moral responsibility, a conscience, first towards God and then uh, towards our our fellow man. Um, We have an immortal soul that the Bible teaches. Our soul will live forever. This body will uh, will pass, will not last, but our souls will live uh, forever somewhere, either in eternity uh, in hell apart from God or in heaven uh, with God. Uh, We have the ability to reason, to think logically, to have this conversation about where we came from. You know, the, when, when, when two dogs come up to each other and they're, they're sniffing noses and other body parts, um, they're, not, they're not talking about where their ancestors came from. You know, what country did you come from? Where do your, they, they don't have this, uh, um, this sense of, of, of concepts and abstract concepts. Um, the, the, the level of emotion and relationships that we have as humans is not the same as an animal. Um, we communicate through uh, spoken word, but written word. So the, there are many things that make us uh, like God and not like other created beings or created creatures. Um, but then some theologians would just argue, look, you can spend all the time you want arguing what it means to be made in the image of God we, we, we just fall short in, in being able to do that. Like the, 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 the various ways and aspects that we are in the image of God, we, we cannot um, bring them all together. And so they just want to say, look, we are made in the likeness of God and we are put here on earth to represent God. I think we see that uh, here with Adam because in verse 29, uh, it says, God bless them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing. God said, look, you are, uh, you're made in my image. I'm going to put you on earth, and you are going to govern for me. So Adam was made in the image of God to uh, be put on the earth to represent God, to govern uh, for him. And I think it's probably worth noting, and uh, we've mentioned sin already this morning. We are not perfect image bearers. We are not like God in, in, in this area of sin and choosing uh, what is wrong over, over what is right. So verse 28 is an important verse uh, in, in talking about shaping 
our worldview. We're not here randomly. We're not here incidentally. We're not here without purpose. Uh, God created male and female, he says in Genesis 127, and in Genesis 128, he tells us two of the reasons why he created us, to, uh, to multiply and fill the earth and to rule and govern over, over all of creation. It's really interesting, Adam and Eve, and if, we, if you look at the account in, in Genesis chapter 2, you actually see that Adam was created first and he was given these instructions to uh, rule over the garden before Eve was created. So uh, guys, it's Father's Day, God created you to work. Uh, God created, created all of us to work, to contribute, to be useful, to add value, to represent God and, and govern in this uh, world. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing. Work is not a bad thing. It's what we were created to do. Uh, but it also says Adam and Eve were created, uh, they were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Adam and Eve were to have kids who would have kids who would have kids until the earth was full of people. Of course, I don't know, eight, seven billion, eight billion people. Somehow, uh, we've kept that command. Of all the things that we, that we have uh, rebelled against God in, we have uh, filled the earth. Uh, but I think the, the idea was to not just fill the earth randomly and just full, but fill the earth with people who would bear my image. And we all, in a sense, all humans bear God's image. We bear God's image more closely when we give our lives to him and we are becoming more and more uh, like Christ. So, um, any guidelines? Are there any guidelines in the scripture for how the earth is to be filled? Well, I think, I think, that, there, I think that we can see that um, very quickly. Um, in order for the world to be filled, it requires men and women to come together. Right? If men and women don't come together, then the earth does not continue to be filled. Uh, somebody, somebody said, uh, uh, I, f- I think I was listening to a podcast, and they said, you know why the government is concerned about uh, marriage? For one reason. If a, if a country or if a culture does not produce offspring, they will exist no more. And so the, you get tax incentives for having kids, it's because without kids, then your culture dies. You must the culture must reproduce or it ceases to um, exist. Um, So like other species of plants and animals, the human body has been carefully and precisely designed to reproduce. Again, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but it's it's an amazing part of uh, the creation of God, the human body. But are there any other... Uh, instructions, or are there any other details, or are there any other guidelines other than men and women must come together in order for us to reproduce? Well, Genesis 2, verse 24, gives us some, uh, gives us some guidelines. We read to verse uh, 23 already, and it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, okay, so picture with me. Apparently, there is, at very minimum, there is a father, and there is a mother, and there is a son, and they are together, because they have to be together in order for the son to leave. So there's, there's, this is the very first description in Scripture of a family unit, a father, mother, and a child. And, uh, and, and the wife uh, must have come from another similar family unit or because the, the wife is also leaving and cleaving. So uh, the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. So uh, the, 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 the man is going to leave his father and mother. The woman is going to leave her mother and father. And they are becoming a new family unit. And when it says here that they will... Uh, hold fast, that the, the man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. We're not talking about, you know, they're so excited, they get to form this new union, so they're going to embrace each other. Uh, that's not really the description uh, that's happening here. This description, holding fast, is speaking of a covenant relationship, the 
what we call marriage. And you might say, okay, that's a little bit of a stretch. All it says is hold fast. It doesn't say that they're married. It doesn't say that they're in covenant with one another. It just says that they hold fast. So go with me um, to Deuteronomy chapter, I have it on the screen. Is it chapter 10? It is chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, the people of Israel are on the edge of the promised land. Moses is about to um, reiterate with this new generation all of the Mosaic Covenant. He's going to tell them all the commands that they received on Mount Sinai, uh, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 10, really pretty much for the rest of the book. And he starts with a prelude that starts in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Uh, So this is the introduction to the covenant that he's about to um, declare to the people of Israel. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today for your good. Now he hasn't actually given him the commandments and statutes yet. He's getting ready to tell them. So a few verses later down in this, in this prelude to the covenant, he says, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear, he is your praise, he is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. So um, back to verse 20 on the screen if you can. You shall serve him and hold fast to him and by his name you shall swear. This is language of the covenant. The people of Israel are about to hear the covenant that their, that their uh, fathers and grandfathers had heard at Mount Sinai and, and Moses is saying, look, hear the covenant, hear what I'm about to say, this is your God, hold fast to him and swear by his name. So this idea of holding fast is covenant language and God is saying to the man, you are going to enter into a covenant with this woman as you leave your father and mother and she leaves her father and mother you're going to come together in a new relationship, a covenant relationship. It's what we call the marriage relationship. A husband and a wife are the foundation of the family unit that brings forth children for the next generation, so the next generation can bring forth another generation. Okay, that's a bunch of groundwork. Uh, We're going to continue with this idea of family and and male and female next week. But I want to spend a few minutes this morning on Father's Day because the father is part of this family unit that we're laying the foundation for. And uh, for a word for fathers uh, today, um, on Father's Day, I want to read from Colossians 3, uh, starting in verse 18. It says this, Wives... Submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So there's the wife and there is the husband, the man and the woman who have left their father and mother and cleaved together. Children, these are the ones that we're filling the earth with. Obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. All right, so some instructions here for the whole family, and uh, I think it's, it's worth talking about this on Father's Day. I don't know, if it, I don't know what your families are like. Um, I'm not the easiest person to buy a gift for. Um, one, because I don't, I don't know, I just really don't ask for much. Um, two, it's almost impossible for these guys to get me to tell them anything I would like them to buy for me, and I don't know, I don't have any other reasons. So these guys are always saying, what, what can we do? And I'm like, let's just spend time together. If we can eat a meal together and spend the afternoon together, what, what more do I need? <laughs> here's, here's some things. Here's some things. Maybe you didn't get anything for your dad today. Here's some things that you can do. 
Wives, submit to your husbands. That's verse 18. Ephesians says that the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. We're not talk, we've talked about this before. We're not talking about who is more important. We're not talking about who has more value. We're talking about the order in which God created things. And we've been talking about the order and design a lot in Genesis. We see uh, here in this passage, there is order and design for the family. There's order and design for the church. Um, when, we, when, we, when we say husbands have the responsibility of being the head of the home, the wife has the freedom to submit to her husband. I got an amen, but I might have some puzzled looks as well. Submission, freedom, aren't those two opposites? Well, would you, I think it's a true statement, would you say that as a follower of Christ, there is freedom in submitting to Jesus? Is there? Okay, so if, if the husband is to be head of his wife as Christ is to be head of the church, then there should be freedom for the wife to submit to her husband. The freedom really comes when in verse 18, excuse me, verse 19, husbands, you are loving your wife and not being harsh with them. It is much easier for a wife to submit to a husband who is uh, loving his wife Presenting her to the Lord as holy and blameless, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, then that submission becomes a freedom because the, the husband has the responsibility and the wife can submit in freedom. We're going to talk more about the husband and wife relationship uh, next week. So husbands are to love their wives. Selfless, never-ending love that continues even if it's not reciprocated kind of love. It's a love that has little regard for self and complete regard for the other. It's a love that says, uh, it's the end of the day and I'd rather sit on the couch but I will still give because I love you kind of love. This is the love, guys, husbands, some of you fathers, that you should love your wife with. And I will say this, if, to the dads, you want to give a gift to your kids. I know you're, this, is, this is the day about dads, kids giving to their dads, right? Dads, if you want to give a, a gift to your kids, then love your wife well. So that they can learn, so that, so that your, your sons can learn what it means to love a woman and your daughters can see what it means to be loved by a man. So fathers, you want to give a gift to your kids today or this week, love your wives as Christ loved the church, a sacrificial uh, love. So kids, we've got a lot of mature kids in the room this morning. We have some, some young students in the room as well. You want to give a gift to your dad today? You forgot to buy him something? Uh, right here in Ephesians, or excuse me, Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. For, for the adult kids in the room, uh, Ephesians talks about honoring your mother and father. So you, you know, you've, you're grown, you're on your own, you don't obey in, in the same sense, but we still honor our parents, honor our fathers. Um, so for, for, for our uh, kids that are here this morning, listen to your dad. You want to give him a gift? Be obedient. Any kids in here that could do that today? That, that is a gift to, well, to your mom and your dad, but to, it's Father's Day today. Adult children, we can honor our fathers. Consider what he has to say. Uh, to, we can give him an opportunity to have a voice in our lives. And the scripture says this also pleases our heavenly father. Now, I know we've talked about sin already this morning. We don't live in a world with perfect people. We certainly don't live in a world with perfect dads. Uh, some of these instructions, you're like, yeah, you don't know my dad. No, I don't know your dad, but God knows him. And these instructions are still here for us. So uh, some, some, some father-son, uh, father-daughter relationships are complicated. I know that. I'm not, I'm not 
uh, uh, saying just get over it, but we are to make an effort to obey our parents for the young ones. We are to make an effort to honor our parents as adults. And, and there, are, there are many other scripture passages that will talk about how we can do that uh, in difficult situations. All right, so to the dads, do not provoke or aggravate, exasperate, antagonize your kids lest they become discouraged. I think the first application of this verse is, would be, uh, that you, we hear more often is don't be overbearing. Don't be harsh in your punishment. Don't be unreasonable in how you uh, punish your kids or discipline your kids or correct your kids. Um, and that is good application, but there's another, another side to it that I don't think we hear so often is dads that under-discipline. Dads that leave it for mom. Dads that are, are, are present but not a part of the family unit. That's frustrating for a kid. That's, that's, that will provoke a child in a different way. Uh, so dads, we need to be involved in our kids' lives. And we got, we got dads of young kids here. We have uh, dads of mature uh, adults here. And so it, again, switches from from expecting your kids to be obedient to hoping that your kids will honor you. Uh, but we can still speak into the lives of our kids uh, as, um, as, as they are adults. They need guidance. Kids need instruction. They need a dad who is uh, not just physically in the building, but engaged in the family unit. So... God created the family unit. Dads are a big part of that unit. Husbands need to love their wives. Dads need to be involved in the kid's life in a way that provides structure and instruction and correction, but isn't um, aggravating and provoking. And then, you know, okay, kids, you can't just flip this on dad and say, right now you're making me mad, dad, and the Bible says don't make me mad. We understand what it's saying there. Guys, we can love our wives and be involved with our kids. It is a God-ordained role. And no matter where you are uh, with your, to the dads, where you are with your kids today, where you have been, uh, no matter how successful you've been in the past or uh, the, the size of your, the, your failures in the past, you can start today and say, God, I, I can see in your word that I have a God-ordained role in my family. And I haven't done the best in the past, but I, I'm committing today to turn a new page. And, and you, can, you can step forward today um, and, and make an effort within your family, with your wife, because your kids are watching, and with your kids because they need a dad. We're going to close the service today by uh, honoring the dads that are, are present. Uh, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And when I, after I pray, I'm going to invite all the dads to come forward. We have a little uh, something for you. And, uh, and Sarah's going to come and pray over the dads that are here this morning. Father, uh, we see in your word uh, over and over again, and particularly in these first few chapters of Genesis, that you created the world uh, with a design. Uh, you created the world uh, to have order. Uh, you created the world um, with intention. And, and part of that is the family unit, consisting of a, of a father and a mother and, and, and kids. And uh, Lord, you, you see all things. And so, so you know where we uh, fall short in, in those areas. And yet uh, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so, Lord, uh, wherever we find ourselves this morning, I pray that we would call out to you uh, because we need you in our lives. Um, every, every one of us do, particularly for the dads this morning. We need you uh, to guide us, to lead us, to give us strength, uh, to give us the ability to, to love and to lead and to nurture and to care for. And so, Father, I pray that uh, each one of the dads here today would call out to you uh, to meet the need that we have uh, to represent you well as husbands and as fathers today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you are a father, I want you to come up to the front. We're going to pray over the dads this morning. Um, I need, I need uh, four young people. Two, got two baskets on this side and two baskets on this side. Uh, if you grab them, I'll start uh, volunteering. Uh, like uh, Hannah Walsh and her sister, come on. I got two baskets over here and I need two people on this side. Who's Court? Court's taking a picture. All right, what other kids are in here with us this morning? Somebody's pointing. We have some Wheeler kids in here. Hannah's pointing. Like, here comes Abigail. And you guys come in and grab these baskets and come right up to the front here. You guys can help pass these, these out after Sarah prays. Good looking group of men, isn't it, ladies? <laughs> and of course, when I look out over this group of men, I see men who have fathered me throughout the years, who have also helped father my children. And, um, and I see men who are, who are fathering right now, men who Will Father, I, I was looking at uh, Kristen and Noah had their little ones up front and um, just thinking about the men in this room besides Noah who will come alongside and help raise up those, those young children. And um, some of you do not have biological children. Some of you are fathers because you're stepfathers or adoptive fathers. Some of you are fathers because you've chosen to... Um, spiritually mentor and um, I see Kevin is sitting down but really Kevin you should be up here with these men because you are a father to young men in our church spiritually and and when we think about the God ordained um, gift of fatherhood it, it is that we would raise up children to bear the image of Christ and we do that through spiritual mentoring. And so some of you that are sitting should be standing, even some of you who are young adults. And I would just say this to you men, if I think about what's my prayer for the men of House of Prayer? What's, what's our hope? Our hope is that you would know deeply your purpose, which is, God said, I have created them for my glory. It's so simple, really. We make life complicated. You were created for His glory, which is His fame. That word translated is fame. And we bring Him fame by multiplying His image across the earth. And so we do that certainly by having children, but by spiritually raising up young men and women who will bear the image, the famous image of our Creator throughout the earth. And the mandate, the way to do that is make disciples, teaching them everything I have taught you. And so in this way, if you are a man, young or old in this room, you have the potential to be a father. And my prayer is that all of you would be spiritual fathers to whomever God puts in your life. And if you don't have someone now, find someone. Let me pray over you. Father, I think today of, of those who, first of all, I want to just acknowledge this is a painful day for some, some who long to be a physical father and that gift has not yet been granted. And I ask, Lord, in your mercy and in your kindness that you would provide that gift. And if you don't, then we trust that you are a God who will provide the grace to walk through life without that gift. And so I ask that you would bring those men comfort and bring them renewed sense of purpose that they can be spiritual fathers even if not physical 
Lord, you're the God of all comfort. And so I ask you to comfort that man in this room. And Lord, I think about the women and men who have lost fathers in the last year or have lost them recently. And today is a day of sorrow as well as maybe joy. And again, I ask the God of all comfort to remind us in our pain and in our hurting that we have a day to look forward to when we are united with our Heavenly Father and there will be no more tears. And then, Lord, I pray over these men, young and old, that stand up here, clearly given the stewardship of fatherhood. God, would you burn in their heart the clear purpose that their goal is to bring you fame, to make your name known on this earth, to make your name known in Blairsville, to make your name known in Georgia, to make your name known in the United States, to make your name known in North America, to make your name known across the continents, across the globe, so that when we enter into eternity, we know the people around us that are worshiping you from every tribe and nation saying, holy, holy, holy is our Lord. Let this be the purpose of the men of House of Prayer and let this be the purpose of the men in this space. Lord, for this reason, from this day forward, we want to not cease in praying and we ask you to fill these men with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they may live worthily of you. May they please you in all respects. May they bear fruit in every good deed. May they grow in their knowledge of you. May they be strengthened in all power according to your glorious might. May your will be done in their lives. May your will be done on earth. May your will be done in their homes. I pray for restoration of broken relationships with their children. I pray for restoration of marriages for these men. I pray for a confidence, not that they'll figure it out, but that your divine power has given them everything they need for life and godliness. And may they stand up tall and walk boldly into their homes with confidence that the God of creation the God who designed the family unit has promised to give them everything they need to accomplish the task that you have given them. And may they embrace that task and may that be the race that they run all the way to eternity. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask and pray it. Amen. Oh, we're going to give out the, we're going to give out, have. what time? The girls have. All right, the girls are going to give you your prizes, men. And we do prize you, and we love you. And congratulations to all the new fathers. First Father's Day, what a gift. We love you guys. Ladies, do we love them?